when you don't know the way of the Spirit. Oak House Church brings to you the word of life, which is able to build you up and offer you an inheritance among all those that are sanctified. Sit back and listen, and may your life become more like that of Christ as you encounter His Word. God bless you. We have said it before. I want to re-echo it again. That you must is not a choice. You must belong to a particular unit called the mentorship unit, the house mentorship group. You must belong to one. If you don't want to belong, it is Nobody's going to call police. We are not going to pray fire and brimstone on you. But just be rest assured that when there is a need, you will want us to do X, Y, Z for you. Whether it is wedding, whether it is uh, uh, whatever it is, a need, when it comes up, because definitely it will come. You will not go in to get our attention. We will not answer you. Is that clear? We will not answer you. We have said it several times. But if you choose not to belong to any mentorship group, there's no problem. But just know that you are not going to receive any of our assistance that you require from us, except if you just want person to cancel you on, on a particular issue and all of that, that's okay. We don't have any problem with that. I will do that. But for us to go out of our way to do X, Y, Z for you and all of that, we will not be able to do it. <clears throat> Number two, I want also to continue to encourage each and every one of us, do everything within your power to always be in the presence of God. Attend church meetings and church services. Build your life in the church. Interwoven, your, you don't have another family. When the time comes, a time is going to come. This church that people give reasons as to why they will not come to church, you have one or the other reason, and they are very, very cogent. A time will come. When you will seek to come to church, you will not be able to do so again. Jesus said, walk, because there are 12 hours in a day where every man ought to walk, because the night comes when you will not be able to do that. Especially as we see the darkness approaching, some of us are still not aware that there is darkness. It's getting thicker and thicker. And all of a sudden, it will hit like a woman in uh, labor. All of a sudden, it will strike. That's when you start looking for church and all of that. That time, you will not be able to access the church. A time is coming when it will be difficult for church to meet. The darkness is coming. The end of the age is coming. I know that many of you don't believe it. Because just like you have been hearing over the years, we are, what about our forefathers? This is what they've been telling us. We've been hearing it. People come and they live and they die and they go. They come, live, die and go. Uh, so the same way we are going to come and live and die and go. Well, a word is enough for a wise. If you like, you take it. If you don't like, you can drop it. Number three, 
we are aware of the fact that as a body of Jesus Christ, as a church, we are at different levels of our growth in Christ. We are at different levels of our experiences, our maturities, and all of that. They are in different levels and different sizes and shapes. And by so saying, we know that people are bound to have misunderstanding with each other or with one another. It is, it is bound to happen. In any place where it does not happen, then that place does not exist. Even in the marriage, it must be there. If it is not there, that marriage is not real. It must be in the church. If it is not there, that church is not real. So because of that, when we have issues, we have what we call the disciplinary committee, the committee that looks into issues and settle problems. Okay? So please, go to such people and table your your complaints, and they will take it up and they will deal with it accordingly. Because what happens is that sometimes, and I've said before, but bef you know, when somebody have when you when somebody have a problem with you, or you have a problem with somebody, God, I love this song, the choir sang. Everything is rooted in the word of God. Have you seen that song? You, you, did you notice? Everything is rooted in the word. When you have a problem, crisis management and conflict resolution, the first thing that you do, you go to the person that offended you. You talk it with the person. If you are not satisfied, then you can go to that committee and let them know about this. And they will deal with it. If at the end of the day, they do not want to listen to the committee that the church has put up, then they will now bring it to the knowledge of the church proper. And then the church will now give their final verdict. That's how it is done. We want to follow the principles that God has given to us. The principle by which we live. It is by God's word. Okay? So, number four. Life, this life we live, is about decisions. You make decisions every day. Everybody, you make decisions. Just like this morning, people made up, made decision not to come to church. It's a decision. So make decision to come to church irrespective of what happens. You can make your decisions and all of that. Whatever decision you like, you, because it's, you make decisions because issues are going to be coming, challenges and all of that. And so you are barraged with a lot of issues and then you need to take decisions and all of that about what to do. I want to advise you. Any decision that you are making, make it in line with the Word of God. Let the Word of God be the guide in every decision that you make. Do not seek the counsel of the ungodly. Don't make ungodly decisions. Any decision, listen, any decision that you are making in this life that will pull you away from God or tamper with your relationship with God, if that decision, every decision is meant to be bringing you closer and closer and closer to Jesus Christ in your fellowship, in your interaction, in your worship, in everything. If the more you take those decisions, they are meant to draw you closer and closer. If that decision you are taking is not drawing you closer to God, that decision is wrong. 
you are going to live to regret it. Sometimes such decisions, when you make that decision, it becomes so bad that it will almost be impossible for you to revert it. Before I say anything, before I do anything, before I go anywhere, I want to find that this is what I do. Is it the way that God wants me to do it? Is it God? Is it what God wants me to say? Does God take pleasure when I go to so and so places? This is what rules and controls man. That is how God can now speak to you. That's when you can now hear. But if your heart is not tuned to that, you're not going to hear anything from God. Make your decisions. I was taking time last Sunday to talk to us. I, I think either last Sunday or last Thursday, I can't remember. I said, and I beg you, you see this your life? Hmm? Carry this your life. Pour it inside God. Pour it inside church. Let it be that anywhere they look for, anytime they, they, say, they, they say, where is Emmanuel? Huh? Where else will you see Emmanuel? Why are you asking about Emmanuel? Go to church and you will see him. That is his life. Let people say such things about you. The church is the ultimate. Finally, You know, rain is falling today. That's why majority of the people will not come to church. And then one or two things, issues come up on a Sunday morning. I've preached about it before, and I won't want to go back again to the world to open it because I won't do. There are seven days in a week, is it not? Is it not? And God said, you have day one to yourself, day two to yourself, day three, now you get up. Day four, it won't disturb you. Day five, day six, they are all yours. On day seven, day seven is God. It does not belong to any human being on earth. No organization, no empire, no kingdom. You dare not try it. You dare not touch it. No matter who is the one giving you instruction to disobey Sunday worship, when God said, every soul must gather and worship me. Because even God himself, he said he rested on the seventh day. Don't touch that day. That day belongs to Jesus Christ. No matter what, whatever the price is, pay it. When that rain is falling, if rain is falling and all of that, dress up and enter the rain and walk into let the rain beat you. And come to church. When you come to church, you'll be shaking like this. You go to one side and be dripping the water from your butt. When you finish, go and sit under the fan. Let the fan blow you. And then you dry up. Unless some people find you. Whatever it is you need to do, do it. There is no price great enough that, or no sacrifice that somebody will say you have paid. You know why I'm saying this? We have, not seen, we have not seen the other side of this life. We have not seen what is there, what is in it for us. You've read about that woman that used her hair to wash or clean the feet of Jesus Christ. It's a woman, no? It's a natural hair. It's not an attachment. It's not an attachment. Don't blame me. I didn't say anything, no. 
No, she used her nature, her hair. The glory of the woman, the beauty of the woman is that her hair. I don't know what they see in her. A woman is ready to carry one million naira on her hair in the name of wig. Some are two million, some are five million. Just put it on the hair. If you see what they take, if you see the amount of money and dollar just on the hair, that's their glory. But a woman bend down and use it to clean somebody's Jesus feet. What else? What price can you not pay as a woman? You say you have done it too, it's too big for God. It's not. Because ultimately at the end of the day, what she stands to gain Eh? What she stands to gain. I, I want you to take out time and meditate on that scripture that says that eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. Neither has he entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those of them that love him. The glory that shall be revealed is nothing. That's why he said, no suffering in this life is worth comparing. There is no amount of suffering, no amount of sacrifice, no amount of thing that you ever, ever think you have done can be compared to the glory that will be revealed to you and in you. And then, like I said, we pray, we hold prayer meetings because Jesus said, my house shall be called the house of prayer and we must pray. It's not just about program. We are not just, and I don't want to have that kind of mindset that is when we have a program that you do prayer. It's supposed to be a lifestyle of the church. When we call for prayer, join the prayer and pray. Come and pray. You are living in, uh, where is the father's place after Ebe? Is there any other place after Ebe? Maybe you are living in Ebe. Leave that place, come here and pray. When you finish, you go back. You go and meet a um, hold up and you stay in the hold up for seven hours. Is not worth the price. Is not. It cannot be compared to the glory, to the blessing you are going to. Because you need. We, we have to come to a point where we know this kingdom thing and all of that. There, are, there are prizes to pay. Be, make up your mind to pay that price. Make those sacrifices. Amen. I say amen. I think it's after this week, after next, this coming weekend, it's going to be the program, the outreach program. And then after that, like I said, for the next one week, we're going to be coming to church. You just come. I didn't say you should do It's not online. You come to church here. You pray. You pray for one hour, at least one hour. Once you do one hour, you are free to go. And don't just do any other thing. Just pray in the spirit. Pray in tongues. Pray in tongues. Once you step in, just offer yourself, release yourself, ask the Holy Spirit to take over. And then pray in the spirit for one hour. When you finish, you say in Jesus' name, carry your bag, enter your car, go. Anytime you come, you pray. You see, this is our house must be called. See, what you do is a seed. You are sowing. You are sowing a seed. That seed is going to germinate. The fruit of it, you are going to reap it in the time to come. Sometimes in days, sometimes in weeks, sometimes in months, sometimes some of them in years. And mostly in eternity, you are going to... Because it's when you cross over to the other side, you say, wow. 
I didn't even know that all this thing I was doing, it has recompense of reward for me. Don't live your Christian life based on, uh, you don't want, you don't want, um, you don't want um, stress. It must stress you. It, it, it must, you see this creature, it must stress you. It must tear you. The Bible says we are not only called to believe, but also to suffer. And Jesus said, except you suffer with him, you cannot reign with him. He said, those of them that endure till the end. Christianity is not a, a where you come. They are the juicy part of it. And there is also the hard aspect of it. They are all put together. If that is the joy of it. You won't die. It's just about, the, the problem is just the flesh. Is the flesh, so all this is, is the flesh, is to kill the flesh, is to take the flesh out of the way. That is why all this paying of prizes and all, is to discipline this flesh, this flesh and keep it out of the way so that the glory of God will show. Amen. I say amen. amen. I say praise the Lord. Hallelujah. It just occurred to me again. I let me record this. Niger Bet. King Bet. I think there is one they say King Bet. They have a Bet King. Niger Bet. Bet King. Sporty Bet. Where are those Bet? Yeah? One X, two X, three X, five X, all those X and all those beds. Four X. They are all gambling. All of them. As a child of God, you cannot be involved in such acts. As far as heaven is concerned, it's a criminal offense. But as far as the earth is concerned, it's a legal business. There are things you cannot do. We are not, see, I don't want, if you go to the book of Proverbs, I can read it out for you, all these things. But I don't have the time for it now. The book of Proverbs is a book of wisdom. And when you don't walk in wisdom, you walk as a fool. And fool never succeed in life. That is why people who go into it, that thing is a spirit. Because when you start it and start it, after some time, you become obsessed with it. You cannot deliver yourself anymore. Even when you make it, that is, is beyond your control. You have taken over your will, your willpower. Even when you say you are not going to do it, you end up doing it. And the same thing applies to other kinds of uh, lifestyle that people live. Maybe he's into drugs or drinking or womanizing. So you get to a point where the spirit of that thing enters a man. You can't control yourself. You can't say no. He has taken possession of you. Even as a Christian, at that point, the only thing you need to do is you ask for help, for deliverance. If you don't do that, you will not be set free. And that thing will oppress you, it will harass you, it will put your head down. You will never succeed. Leave gambling alone. You've not seen what this thing, what this thing does to people. It's very dangerous. It will ruin your life. I have never seen one person, one human being that have succeeded in gambling. Say you have done gambling and all of that. This is the product of my gambling. This is the works of my gambling. You can see this house. You can see this business. You can see this is what I have done with this gambling. You can see. Just like you see somebody say, I've been a harlot. I've been a sex worker and all of that. This is what I have achieved. 
or maybe somebody like an armed robber. You say, I've been, I've been into armed robbery, uh, armed robbery, a company of armed robbery, uh, uh, you know, uh, armed robbery PLC. So this is what I have achieved and all of that. You won't see such a thing. The same thing with this kind of gambling. Somebody goes and borrow money and put into something and the thing fizzles away. You think, you think, you go and borrow another one. Maybe not borrowing. You go and collect all the money that you have and put inside. The next thing you collect from your wife. When your wife own is finished, you start borrowing from outside. Meanwhile, you, the one that you have borrowed, you have not paid. You keep borrowing and put, what is the matter with you? Can't you think? Is evil. God will help me. You know, like I said, as long as I'm aware that this is what you are doing and all, if I find that you cannot cross this altar, you can't climb here, and you can't be in any leadership of the church, in any form, because that is bad, it is, is a cancer, it will, it, will, it will destroy the rest of the lump. Amen. It's not good. Advise anybody that you know that advise the person against it. Luke chapter 17. Verse 20. So let's do the business of the day. Luke chapter 17, verse 20. I want to talk to us today about the kingdom within. The kingdom within. The kingdom inside. And when he was demanded of the Pharisees, the Pharisees demanded from him, from Jesus Christ, he said, when the kingdom of God shall come, they demanded from him to know when the kingdom of God shall come. And he answered them and said, The kingdom of God cometh not with what? Observation. It's not something that you see with your eyes. It's not a physical thing. It's not like the government of the day. Where you say that APC has won or PDP or Labour Party or whatever has won. You have now become the president. So you are now... You have your staff, you have your ministers, you have everybody and all of that. You're running up. That is not, he said it doesn't come with that kind of observation. Verse 21, he says, Neither shall they say, lo, here or lo, there. For behold, the kingdom of God is where? The kingdom of God is where? Say, the kingdom of God is within me. So the kingdom of God is in me. Where is the kingdom of God? It's inside. It's not outside. They've talked about the kingdom of God as a promise in the Old Testament. They promised the kingdom of God through the prophet, they prophesied, they spoke about it, about the coming kingdom. And then in the New Testament, finally that kingdom showed up. That kingdom, Jesus Christ brought that kingdom. And he said, now the kingdom of God is within you. It does not come with observation. It's not, it doesn't come with fanfare. It doesn't come with uh, this kind of whatever we see today. That's not the kingdom of God. And I said, the kingdom of God is coming in two phases. The kingdom is coming in two phases. The first is the kingdom within. The second is a kingdom without. The kingdom without is when that physical kingdom, when Jesus Christ is going to be the world president, he is going to rule the whole world and the headquarters will be in Jerusalem. So that's a kingdom that will come with observation. You can see it. In that very kingdom, in that very kingdom of Jesus Christ, no one single unbeliever will be in any government at all. No one single person. There are people who are, who are going to be unsaved. 
There are people who will not be saved in the king, in that kingdom, but none of them will ever smell the even what is the least uh, position in the in the government today? What's the least position? Ward counselors. Ward chairman. Even ward chairman, no unbeliever will even near it. That's when the Bible says righteousness will rule, reign everywhere. So there are two aspects of this kingdom. The first is within. You can liken it to the first coming of Jesus Christ and then the second coming of Jesus Christ. He has come the first time to bring about the kingdom within. The second time he is coming is to bring about the kingdom without, the physical kingdom, where he is going to destroy and defeat all his enemies, put them down, and then establish his millennial reign of that 1,000 years. So presently, this kingdom we are preaching, may thy kingdom come. That kingdom, first of all, will come inside of you before it comes outside. So the kingdom of God came through the preaching of the gospel. It came through the preaching of the gospel. And that is why in that Matthew chapter 4, 17, the Bible says, and when Jesus Christ came, he was preaching, saying, repent for the kingdom of God is come. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. If the kingdom of God is within, what does it mean? What's the implication that the kingdom of God has come and it is within you? What has it come to do within me? What has it come to do inside of me? What's the meaning of that? I don't understand. Pastor, please explain. The kingdom of God, first of all, it comes with power. The kingdom of God comes with power. And that is why he said the kingdom of God is not about, the, the kingdom of God is not in words. It's not about words, but about, about what? The kingdom of God is not in words, but in power and the demonstration of the spirit of God. It comes with power. It comes with the power of God. And it's coming inside of a man. It's not coming outside. It's not the power that will enthrone a man to sit on a, gov on, a, on a presidential seat or government and all of that. No, it is the power that comes to live with him. And what does that power do? What does that power do? The kingdom of God comes with power in order to destroy first the works of Satan in a man. First John chapter 3 verse 8 says, He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of Man was made manifested, that he might do what? Destroy the works of the devil inside a man. That's the first thing that he comes to do. That's why it comes with power to destroy every work of the devil. We know that in John chapter 10 verse 10, the Bible says, the thief, which is the devil, cometh not, but to do what? To steal from you. He's not coming to steal your book or steal your car and all of that. That's not the stealing. He cometh not, but to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Everything good about you. Everything good in you, he comes to rob you of it. Because until you destroy a man inside, you can't destroy any other thing outside of him. Before you can destroy what the man has, you have to crush him inside. That's why the Bible said that if you are overcome with evil in a time of adversity, it means your strength is what? Weak. So before anybody can crush you, can defeat you, they want to 
destroy your spirit. They will crush it, everything, from inside. Every other thing outside of you collapses. So he comes, Satan comes to destroy. And he, that is the work he had done. He had destroyed man. Look at what he did to Adam in the Garden of Eden. Look at what he did to Adam and Eve. Look at what he did to God's creation. So, everything that, that, everything that has to do with the kingdom, they are not physical. That's why he said it is, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. They are not physical. It's not something that you can see with your eyes. It's not something that you can touch. It's not something that you can feel. It's spiritual. That's why the church is a spiritual entity. The body of Christ is spiritual. But if you turn it the other way that the body of Christ is a, a building, the body of Christ is, a, is prosperity, is all that, you will make a lot of mistakes. You have missed it. Everything about the kingdom now is spiritual. Everything about the church is spiritual. That's why the Bible said that we are being built a spiritual house to offer up spiritual sacrifices to God. So the first thing that the kingdom of God comes to do is to destroy that work of Satan and put it out of the way so that he can give man the freedom, the liberty that he wants to enjoy. John chapter 10 verse 10 says, Jesus said, the thief cometh not but for to steal and kill and to destroy. He said, but what I come to do is to destroy that work of Satan and then offer you life and offer you abundant life. That's what the kingdom of God has come to offer. The kingdom of God within. He will destroy the siege of Satan in a man. That thing that had made man an enemy of God. That thing that made man to be rebellious to God. That thing in man that makes him to not to obey the word of God, not to serve God, not to worship God, not to acknowledge that God is God indeed. That thing that is in man, that is the work of Satan. So God said Jesus Christ came to destroy that thing in man. And then once he destroyed them, he gives you life. And not only that, he gives you life, he gives you abundant life. Is within, not without. But you see, the kingdom of God has two offers. In that first Timothy chapter 4, verse 8, he says, um, Bodily exercise profited little, but godliness is profitable unto all things. It has a promise in this life and also has a promise in the life to come. So the kingdom of God has a promise in this life. It also has a promise in the life to come. There is abundant life that the gospel brings to us. The kingdom of God brings to us. There is an abundant life. There is prosperity that he has brought to us. There is peace that he has brought to us. There is security he has brought to us. He has brought to us all manner of things. The Bible calls it the things that accompany salvation. They are all loaded but they are within. So now you see, before, before you can experience that abundant life, before you can experience indeed the benefits of the kingdom of God that has come within you, before you can experience it around you, because before you can see the blessings of that kingdom for now, 
the promise of this life, before you can see it, first of all, that kingdom of God must first of all be established inside of you. If that kingdom is not established in you, you cannot see its manifestation in your life. If this kingdom of God that has come inside of you, if it is not in you and it is not abiding in you, you cannot experience the blessings that comes with, that it comes with. That is, when I talk about the blessing, I talk about the prosperity, the open doors, the grace of God, the, the, you know, you want to, just like I was asking and telling us on Thursday, you know, everyone, every young man wants to establish, you want to prosper, you want to succeed, you want to make it, you want to blow. You want good life. The kingdom of God promises us that in this life. Just like Jesus said to Peter, anyone that has left father, mother, brother, sister, land, property, and all those things, he said, you are going to have a hundredfold in this life and in the life to come, eternity. I mean, eternal life. So there is a promise of the kingdom of God now. But before you can enjoy it, you must, this kingdom must first of all be established in you. The extent to which it is established in you is the extent to which you can enjoy it in this real life. If it is not rooted and grounded inside of you, you are not going to see it. Did you understand that? Did you? If the kingdom of God that is within you, if that kingdom is not established inside of you, if it is not rooted inside of you, if it is not abiding inside of you, you are not going to experience the blessings, the fruits of that kingdom around you. In other words, you will still be having sicknesses and diseases. Demons will continue to be chasing you. You will be making wrong decisions and you are going to be continue to fail and disappointment upon disappointment and all of that. You will not go into... And then you will be walking like an elephant and then you will be eating like grasshoppers. The reason is because this kingdom has not been established inside. Until it is established inside your wasting your time. And if you say, if you think you are succeeding, you are getting some money and things are happening, and this kingdom is not established, just wait is a function of time. When the wind will blow. Remember what Jesus said? I tell you who a wise man is, is the one that built his house on the kingdom. And is rooted. He says, so that when the wind comes, when the flood comes, when the rain comes, because these three entities, they are going to come after you. It might come in the first year, it might come in the first quarter, or the second quarter, or the third quarter, whichever time, nobody knows. But surely, it will surely come. But one day when it comes, if you are not established inside, if the kingdom is not rooted in you, well, inside, everything that you have built will crumble. It's a fact of life, and that is the truth. So the question now is, how may I know that I'm established within, in this kingdom? How may I know that this kingdom of God that has come within me is indeed in me and is settled in me? There are seven things you must know when you see it in your life, you can be rest assured that the kingdom of God has come. And it has come to stay. 
And then the next thing is that you are going to begin to see the effect of it in every area of your life. Number one, the kingdom of God. Number one is that you must be born again. Number one is that you must be born again. If you are not born again, the kingdom of God cannot come inside of you. And that is why Jesus said in now Matthew, Matthew 4, 17, he was preaching, he said, repent. Because the kingdom of God, so before the kingdom of God will come inside of you, there has to be what? Repentance from dead works. You know, I'm talking about God. We are talking about God now and his kingdom. The things that God is doing. We are not talking about what Satan is doing in the world and all of that. They have their own kingdom. There are two kingdoms. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of this world. Which Satan is the one that rules. Then the kingdom of God, which is of God, which Jesus Christ is the one that rules. And we are telling you how that kingdom operates. That is why he said, verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he can't see the kingdom. Neither can you enter it. Meanwhile, it is the Father's good pleasure to give you this kingdom. According to Luke 12, 32, he says it's the Father's pleasure to give you this kingdom. But if you want to know whether you establish no man, one thing that you must know is that you must be born again. So the question now is, am I born again? We have so many people in church that are not born again. Because that is actually where the problem starts. There are so many people, even in the church, yeah, sometimes I have gone home and I sat down and prayed. I reflect, I wonder whether these people are, this kind of people, are they really born again? Because if you are born again, if you are born again, that is the entrance of the kingdom. That's the very first time the kingdom enters into a man. Because the kingdom comes with him. We have so many people in the church today that are not born again. And a lot of people don't understand the concept of being born again. We think that being born again is coming to church. Maybe your parents are Christians. And so you follow the Christian way, follow your parents and all of that. And so you grew up and then you end up coming to church. That makes you a Christian. You are not a Christian. You are not a Christian because you go to church on Sundays. You are not even a Christian because you come to serve in the church and all that. That doesn't make you a Christian. What makes a man a Christian? Then you go back again to the foundation, to the Berea Academy, to the foundational doctrine of Christ. Because that is what you first of all establish, if you don't establish it, if you are not, the kingdom of God cannot come. So the benefit and the blessings of the kingdom, you are not going to experience it in your life. And you may be pretending that you are born again and all that. It's a function of time. There are people here, Satan has already marked you. At a certain time, he will sniff life out of you. I mean in this church this morning. Here, yeah, this morning. They've already marked you out. Basically, number one is because you're not born again. You can be in the choir. You can be singing, not born again. There are pastors who are behind the pulpit. There are thousands of them. They are not born again. If you are not born again, the kingdom cannot come within you. What does it mean to be born again? If any man is a new creation, if any man is a new creature, 
all things are passed away. You, because the kingdom of God comes with power into a man to destroy the work of Satan. What is the work that the Satan did? The corruption. He corrupted human spirits. It is that corruption that is in the human spirit. He put his nature, Satan's nature, imparted it into the spirit of man. And the spirit of man died. He has no connection or no fellowship, no contact with God. He can't love God. He can't obey God. He can't serve God. He is not drawn to God. Religion can make you be drawn into God and all of that. Trying to make you qualify. By all the things you do. The problem with man is the nature of man is corrupt by Satan. So anything they should say about you don't even understand anything about God. You are not giving to God at all. You will talk from now to next generation. They come to church. They don't hear. The reason is because they have not been born again. If you have ever been born again, you will know. Light cannot shine in the dark and then the dark remains the same. It is impossible. So the question now is that you ask yourself, am I really born again? Do I have an experience of this encounter? Because what happens at a new birth is that God comes in now by the power of the Holy Spirit. He comes into the heart of that man. Takes away that heart. It's a mystery. That's the greatest miracle of all time. When you talk about miracle, there is no other miracle. You can see somebody raised from the dead. That's not, it's not a miracle compared to the miracle of regeneration. The greatest of all miracles. It's a miracle of new creation. What he does is that he comes to you, take away that heart that doesn't want to love God, that is not giving to God, that doesn't want anything. He, is, he, he obeys God when he pleases him and all. He takes that stubborn heart. He, did, he didn't renovate it. He did not amend that heart. He didn't reconstruct the heart. What he did was to carry it completely and remove it totally. To wherever he took it, I don't know. And then he gives you a new heart. A brand new heart. Hello? Hello? If you ever bought a brand new car, some of us have not had the opportunity to have. Even a Tokumbo, Diary Tokumbo car, when you buy it, you know how excited you are. When you bring a tear leather, tear leather, that is, it has still waterproof on it, and it's still smelling. You know how you feel? You know how excited you are? You will sleep in the night. In the middle of the night, you open the window and all of that, be looking at the car. Brand new car. That is what happens when you have a brand new life. Everything about, every, is like, is like, is like a garment, a dark smelling, stinking garment is taken away from you. Fresh air just flood your soul. You came alive. You fall in love with everything that is around you. You will fall in love with the speaker. You will fall in love with uh, everything. You for everything you fall in love with it. The, even the way you handle book and handle things and all of that, you handle with tender care. When they say you be, you be so excited, they all. Oh, you always want to love God and to worship God and to pray. All the time. All the time. All the time. You can't but stay in his presence. You don't need anybody to drag you to send text message or to call you on the phone to come to church and all of that. No! Because the light has shined in darkness and darkness could not comprehend it anymore. 
No follow-up to come to church. Nobody begs you to come to church because you have found a new lover. Everything is new. That's what happened at New Bet. That's when the kingdom of God comes into a man. That's the beginning of the kingdom coming within. Remember we said the kingdom has to come and it must abide. It might come and but not abide. If it has not if it has not abided, then it hasn't come yet. Then it comes. It takes away that heart, gives you a brand new heart. That is what makes you a temple, a house, prepared, prepared for the Holy Spirit to come and live in. Because the place where the Holy Spirit is going to live is inside your spirit man. So that spirit man needs to be recreated. So that having been recreated now, your heart is clean. Pure, brand new heart. And then the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside. That's why the Bible says you are now the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that Holy Spirit that comes to live in there comes at baptism. Holy Spirit baptism. That is when he comes to live inside there. What happens at new birth is that the Holy Spirit comes. He's the one that does the regeneration. The, the work, the actual work was done by the Holy Spirit. But the man, the person that mastered it, the Bible said that Jesus Christ is the minister of the new of the New Testament. He's the one that my but the actual person that does the work is the Holy Spirit. That's not the time the Holy Spirit. So what he did was to come and they take away the old heart and then give you a brand new heart. And then at the baptism, the Pentecost, at the baptism, the Holy Spirit now comes and lives inside the man. You now become the temple of the Holy Spirit. So how do I know that I'm born again? Huh? Just like somebody will ask Mrs. Brian, how do you know that you are in love? That you were in love that time? That Brian was... You can't sleep in the night. Every time Brian's car, that is Honda, is parked in front of uh, your parents' house. Nine o'clock in the night, he's still there. Ten o'clock, he's still there. Meanwhile, he will go to work tomorrow. He will go to work tomorrow. By ten o'clock in the night, he's still in your house. Parents are discussing and talking. You don't need to tell somebody that. You, so how do you know that you are in love? A young girl asked the mother, Mom, he said, yes, my darling. What is it? He said, I want to ask you a question. He said, go ahead and ask. How do you know when you are in love? The mother said, he thought for a while. He said, you will know. <laughs> he said, how do you know? He said, you will know that you know that you are in love. When the time comes, he said, you will know. He said, how do I know? He said, when that time comes, you will know. <laughs> there is a no in inside. That kingdom is inside. He is, you know. Do you need anybody to tell you that you are in love? Abi Debbie. That time, do you need anybody to tell you that you are in love with Brian? The answer is no, because you know. 
You think it gives you sleepless nights. Not sleepless nights in the bad way. You will be dreaming and thinking about him and everything till. And then in the morning again, you will be dreaming and thinking about him till 3, 4, 5 o'clock in the morning. You have not slept. Oh. And then you, sometimes you won't even sleep. In the morning, you will get up like this and you will get ready and you go to work. And you won't feel sleepy in the office. Because it happened to us. And it happens to anybody that is genuinely in love with his wife or his husband. If, except, you are, except you want to pretend holier than thou. Precious, is it not true? <laughs> Another thing that you will know that you are now born again. That the kingdom of God has come to stay. You begin to experience the life of grace. Give me Romans chapter 5 verse 17. Or 21. That as in that as sin had reigned unto death, even so might grace reign. Grace will reign in your life. You know what is grace? You know what is grace? Prayer. You will ne- if you have ever been born again in those early days, you will never have any problem about praying. You no struggle about prayer. If you have been born again, you don't struggle. You can't tell lies. You can't tell a lie. I say you cannot. You can't. It can't be forming your mouth. You can't say it. You would rather. You would rather. You would rather get yourself punished. Than to tell a lie. The things you do, you do it almost like effortlessly. Somebody, something is doing it. Something is working in you. Even all those things, every time you are in the church and all of when they say, let us go to the house, you are glad, you are so excited and something is propelling you, something is moving you. Even giving those of you who, who are now aradite hand, you are hand that's so aradite. That is anything that enters this your hand can't come out again. In those days, eh, you before somebody could say Jack Robbins, you have emptied your pocket and give the person. Your life is full of love, it's about giving and giving and giving and loving and giving. No struggle whatsoever. The grace of God, that is the power of the Holy Spirit that has come within now. He's the one, because he said, in that day, I will take away your, your stubborn heart. I will put a new heart in you, and they put my spirit in you. I will write my laws in your heart. He said, and I will make you to obey my command. And that's what he said in Ezekiel 26. Ezekiel 36, rather. He said, I will curse you. So the one, that is why he said, he, he is the one that is at work in you, both to will and to do. He's the one walking. He that began a good work in you, he will finish it up. He's the one walking inside of you. You experience the grace of God. It will be obvious and glaring. So somebody will see you, he won't know why you are doing it. And you are doing it, you don't even know. In those days, in those days, in those days, I got born again. I came back to the village and all of that. There was no fellowship in my village. You know, I, village fellowship and all of that. I don't just want. So, some of you who are from the east, you know where the Njikoka local government they call it Abaga. They say the, the name is Abaga. And then beside Abaga is my village, where they say I came from. I will go to Oka, the capital headquarters, the headquarters of the state. 
When I finish fellowship there, I will take transport and enter bus and go there. When I finish, because most of the time I didn't have the money, I will trek halfway. Sometimes about six, seven, eight, ten kilometers to come back to the house. And I will do it sometimes through the night. And I will be doing this. I won't even remember. I won't even recognize. I won't even notice it. Something is propelling me to do it. That's why he says it's not by might. It's not by power. It's by my spirit. It's the spirit that is doing it in you. That's the grace of God at work. You reign. The grace begins to reign in your life. Number three. He said that as sin had reigned unto death, even so my grace. So sin that reigned in your life will no longer reign. Sin has come to an end in your life. Sin will no longer dominate your life anymore. According to Romans chapter 6. He said that sin will no longer reign in your mortal body. Verse 12. 5-12. Romans 5-12. He said, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin and don't and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now give me Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. He said, let not sin therefore do what? Reign. The reign of sin, the dominion of sin in your life has come to an end. If the kingdom of God has entered you. You can't sin again. First John chapter 3, verse 10. Verse 8. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of Man was manifested that he might destroy the work of Satan. Verse 9. Whosoever is born of God does not do what? Does not do what? You can't. He said, does not commit sin. That's how you know the kingdom of God has come inside of you and it has come to stay. When these things are established in you, you begin to see the expression of it in everything around you in the works of your hand, in your relationship, in your marriage, in your family, in your children, in your career, in your business, in every area, you will see the impact of this kingdom. It irradiates. It expresses itself. That's why it will first of all be established inside. No one that is born of God commits sin. That is is written in the Bible. Whosoever, can we read it together please? One, two, go. Whosoever. Kabane Fesaka. He said he cannot sin. Why? Do we say? Do we? I am not the one that says it's written. See it in the Bible. Don't don't attack me. Attack God. You see the reason why the thing is not expressing, it doesn't have expression in our lives. Because sometimes you ask yourself, am I really born again? Sometimes the kind of decision we make, sometimes the kind of things we say, 
It makes you wonder because there are certain things that if you are born again, you can't come out of your mouth. And if he manages to come out of your mouth, you will know. It's like somebody stab you. It's like something stab you in the chest. For example, if you open your mouth and say, I hate this man. I have a very big question mark over your, over your salvation. I, I doubt if you are born again. Because if you have this seed inside of you, you can't hate. You can't hate. No one that has eternal life is a murderer. You can't murder with your mouth, with your tongue. You can murder people with your tongue. Anyone that is born of God, you say you cannot sin. The reason is because the seed of God is living inside of you. I want to bring a balance to this. Give me 1 John chapter 1 verse 7. But if we walk in the light as in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, what do we do? And in the other place he said, if you are born again, you cannot sin because the seed of God dwells in you. Here he said, if you say you have no sin, you say you deceive yourself, the truth is not in you. So what is he saying? He's saying two different things, opposite things. See what it means. In the first John 3, 9, where he said, if you are born again, you cannot sin because the seed of God is in you. What he, what he means is that you don't go making practice of sin. You don't enjoy sin. If you, if, you, if you lie, for example, if you lie to somebody, for example, hmm, something inside of you reacts. If you abuse somebody, something inside of you reacts. You feel bad. You don't like it. That is what he means. You don't make practice of sin. You, don't, you know there are people, if you talk, he says, hmm, you know who I am. You know who I am. Hey, 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 you don't know me yet. I am just, and they have known the person like that. that that's the definition of, that's the signature of the person. Once he mentioned that person's name, he said, hey, 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 my hand is not there. But he's born again. He makes practice of sin. Somebody, he can commit fornication. A Christian born again filled with the Holy Ghost. But if he commits that fornication, he will be as if he is dying. He will never rest until he repents and come out of Because that is not his nature. But you see somebody who is, it is his nature, who has not been born again. When he commits fornication, he is very proud. He will even want to go ahead and tell other people and all of that. And he brags and prides because he lives in sin. That's what he means by he who is ever is born again does not live in sin. He doesn't make practice of sin. So in 1 John 1, 7 and 8, he says, if you say you don't make mistakes, you are a liar. We make mistakes. I make mistakes. But when I do, I don't stay there. Even if I tell you now that I'm going to come by 12 and I didn't come by 12, that's a probably very big problem for me. It's a very big problem for me. And what I do is that I will repent, I will repent, and possibly I will pick up the phone, I will call you, and tell you I'm sorry I couldn't come, so, so, and so, and all of that. I will have to clear it, and I make up my mind I'm not going to do that again. Not that you say, not that you, you know, people, we don't know what it means to repent of something. We, <clears throat> there is a difference between confessing your sin and repenting from your sin. Because when you repent from your sin, you don't go back. Repentance means a change of mind. 
It means you are moving this way, and then you turn and move in opposite direction. You are no longer going that direction anymore. That's what it means by repentance. Jesus said there are two brothers. The father said to the first one, go to the farm and do X, Y, Z. He said, Father, I'm not going. The second one, he said, go. The second one, he said, consider it done. And then the father went away. And then when he came back, he found out that the first one that said, I will not go, changed his mind and went. Then the second one that said, consider it done, he didn't go. He said, which of them had done the will of his father? He said, he's the first one that repented. Repentance is to change your mind and begin to do. That's why Jesus said, remember where, concerning your first love, remember where you have fallen. Repent. Come out from there. Come out from those things that you are doing. Before. That's why when you people come and say, yeah, I'm having problems. I don't know what else to do. I have prayed. I have done everything. I, have done. I said it's not complicated. It's not a complicated thing. Jesus said, remember where you have fallen. In other words, remember what you used to do before. Remember how God used to be with you, the kind of fellowship you used to have, the kind of experiences and all of that. How that you're always giving your heart and everything to God and stuff like that. Remember. And then you have fallen from it. He said, repent. Ask God for, me, for mercy, ask him for forgiveness and all of that. That is uh, confessing your sins and all of that. When you finish that, ask him to give you the grace so that you can go back to do the first thing. He said, remember where you have fallen, repent, and then go back and do your first walk. Go back and do those things that you were doing before. Now you have repented, God has forgiven you, and then you have received the ability, the grace, the grace, the reign of grace, the ability of the Holy Spirit. He helps you to go back again and start doing that same thing that you are doing before. It's as simple as that. So that, you know why we are saying this? So that you will... We want, God wants you to succeed. God wants you to enjoy the part of that kingdom here on earth. And then the one that is reserved for you in eternity. You enjoy here and you enjoy there. But first of all, this kingdom must first of all be established in you. It must abide in you. You must be rooted inside. It starts from the inside. It doesn't start from outside. That's why he said the kingdom of God is within you. It doesn't come with fanfare. It doesn't come with observation. It doesn't come initially with all. So we think that the, the way the God says, the way we re, regard God's blessing is that uh, being born again, how you know that God is happy with you and all of that is that prosperity, everything is working and all of that. That's not it. It's the one that starts from inside. If you say that you are blessed and God is prospering you and all of that, I want to, if you tell me that I will agree with you on the surface, then I will go back and I observe what you are doing, how your life is, with the kind of fruit that you bear. That will show me whether it is a reflection of what is on the outside. But if the fruit you are bearing is a negative one, I know that how you get those things are not of God. They are of the world. It's as simple as that. I don't need the Holy Spirit to tell me. By their fruits, you will know them. Romans 5.17 Another way you know that the kingdom of God has been established in you. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. So righteousness reign. If righteousness reigns in your life, you must be established in righteousness. You must be established in uprightness. You must stand for the truth. You must stand for what is right. You must be given to what is right. 
You cannot lie. You cannot cheat. You cannot give bribe. Neither can you receive bribe. You cannot cut corners. When you see something that is wrong, you'll be able to point it out and say, this is wrong. You will not see a white and say, this looks like white. No, it doesn't look like white. It is white. You call a spade a spade. And call pot, pot. Call black, black. Righteousness. Because the kingdom of God is not about meat and drink. It's about righteousness. You must be established in you. Is it not uh, Isaiah 5.20 that says, Woe unto them that say that the right is wrong and that wrong is right. It's a woe. So you must stand up for what is right. When they rig election, you don't support that. Hey, let, us, let us forget and then move on. You don't move on. That is not how it is done. If you steal from me, you must return what you stole from me. You cannot steal my car and you are driving my car and say, let us just, um, let's just move on. Hey, what kind of human being are you? you are, so every day I will see you driving my car and then I will, I will even stop you. Will, yeah, I'm, 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 and then I will give you a thumb up. You are, you, you are driving my, you stole my car and you are driving it. Hey, Mr. Man, go and sit down. There is what is called, the Bible calls it restitution. Restore what you have stolen. Then we can talk about peace. In the world today, that is how they live. They will not do regulation. They plan it ahead of time and orchestrate it. When they finish, they seed everything and say, let us now make peace. With what you have stolen, keep with you. And it is normal to every one of them. They don't see anything wrong about it. Justice doesn't, doesn't work that way. There has to be justice in everything. God is a just God. Haven't you heard it? Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, nor the young man glory in his strength, nor the rich man glory in his riches. He said, but let him that glory, glory that he knoweth me, that I'm a God that establishes, that, the, that loves uh, loving kindness, righteousness and justice. He said, in this thing do I delight. God is a just God. The guilty, he said, will never go unpunished. So I tell people, you see, you cut corners, those little lies, those little schemes, those little, little things that you do and all of that, you think you are smart, you think you are wise, you are just fooling yourself. You are the greatest fool. You have been fooled and you remain fooled. Because what goes around comes around. In Galatians 6, he said, Let, don't be mocked. Do not be deceived. For God cannot be whatsoever. What do you do? You will repeat. That's a law. Established. There's nothing you can do about it. Woman, submit to your own husband and see that you reverence him. Cure ED. That's a law. That's a commandment. Break it, you will reap. He didn't say, if your husband is nice to you, then you can submit to him. He didn't say so. He said to the husband, love your wife the way Jesus Christ loved the church and gave it. He's ready to die for your wife. If your love hasn't come to that point, you have not started. In other words, what is, where you start from there is that everything good, the best of the things, you, your wife should be the one that will have it. True or false? Women, am I communicating? Yes, mm -mm. You won't go and buy a brand new car and then buy Tokumbo and then give your wife Tokumbo. You don't, you are, hey, go and sit down. He must, she must drive that brand tear ladder. You 
the one that they're pushing and going to the mechanic, that's the one that you should be driving. If you don't like it, go and buy another new one. But that new one, it must be your wife. Because, see, that's what the Bible says. The Bible says, you need to lay down. Before you can, if you cannot give your wife the best of the car, is it your life you're going to give? Eh? Is it your life you're going to surrender for her? You don't want to talk. Righteousness. Righteousness. You must be established in it. It's not that you have arrived though. But what I'm saying that these things, eh, these virtues, they must have roots. It's a no-go area. There is no contention about it. Sin is sin. You must live. You see, when you say sin will no longer reign in your life, it means a life of holiness is inevitable. You must live a holy life. That's how you know the kingdom of God has come into your life. And it has abounded in your life. And is abiding in your life. Because every one of us is uh, a project in making. God is working in us. So the extent to which that kingdom of God within you is abiding, the extent to which it abides is the extent to which you manifest it. Is you. That is why your destiny is in your hand. It is not in God's hand. Because everything that pertains to life and godliness, he has put it inside of you. So you are the one that decides the extent to which you are going to enjoy it here on earth and in eternity. You are the one that will decide whether you are going to live in your, in your, in your city. Because I say, the house that Jesus Christ is building in heaven is not a mansion, it's not a, one, um, a, a bungalow or one duplex. It's a city. So everyone owns a city. When you come to it, it's a city. The Bible says Abraham was looking for a city. Because he was, he, the other time he was Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom was not a, a small space. It's where every other person comes and they live. But he's the one that owns it. So you are the one that will decide whether you will live in a city, you will own a city. Or whether you are going to squat with somebody, live in my city. Because if I see you, if I see you in my city, I won't take you. <laughs> Precious, you understand. Another thing that you know, how you know that the kingdom of God has come to stay and is abiding in you, is you are living a life of peace. Hey! Peace. The peace that passes all understanding. Because that is about the kingdom. The kingdom of God is not in words, is not in meat and drink. It's righteousness. It's peace. It's inside of you. You are a peacemaker. You will rather accept to be offended, rather for you to offend people. You will take it. You will rather choose to be wrong. Even though you are right, for the sake of peace, you will accept it. In the kingdom. Let me show you this one. Somebody is looking at me somewhere. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1. First Corinthians 6, 1. There any of you having a matter against another, go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints. You see, that's what I was saying, telling you in the beginning. If you have issues and all of that, there is a committee that we have that deals with it. We are going to mention, you know, Pastor John is there. I think Yakubu is there, um, the pastors, and a couple of other people. He said, "There, any of you having a matter against another, go to the law, or go to law before the unjust, and not before the saint." Verse two. 
He said, do you not know that the saints shall judge the world, and if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more the things or things that pertain to this life? We can deal with it. We don't need to go to court. You don't need to carry the matter to court. We have one in the church. This is how God ordained these things to be. You can't take a matter between you and your brother to court. You can't take your brother to court. You can't take your brother to the police to arrest him. You bring it to the church. Let the church deal with it. You see here, eh? Because we have neglected, we don't know. You don't. We don't know what the church stands for. We don't know the power that the church wields. Know you know that we shall judge the angel. How much more the things that pertain to this life? Verse four. If then you have judgment of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. If you have issue, bring those of them who you think they are nobody, they are, that they don't know anything and all of that. You may be abusing them and all of that. Bring them and see them that they, they have the wisdom of God to deal with that thing. That's what he's saying here. Then, I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother and that before the unbelievers. Now, therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take what? wrong. Why do you not rather suffer yourself to be defrauded than to take your brother to court? That is a man of peace. So, until you are, the Bible says, seek peace and pursue it. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no eye shall see the Lord. So it is peace. It must be established in your heart. You must make peace with your wife. You must make peace with your husband. When you notice that your husband is quarreling and all of that, you, are, you, are, you, you will... Choose the path of peace. If your husband is quarreling, you must choose the path of peace and not the path of war. Okay, I think I'm coming to the end of it. How many have I said? Another one, how you know the kingdom of God has come to stay is that your life is full of joy, joy, joy. Joy, joy, joy of the Lord. Happy, happy, happy. Who know how to sing that song? Do you sing it? Joy, joy. There is a joy song. Joy, 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 joy. Sing it in an even note. Uh, joy overflow in my heart. Uh, uh. I've got joy, 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 oh joy, 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 joy overflows in my heart. I've got joy, joy. Joy, oh joy, 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 joy overflow. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you very much. God bless you. I've got joy, 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 joy overflow. What is joy? What is joy? Joy is the disposition of the heart. 
that expresses itself in a very pleasant, happy, excited mood all the time, irrespective of whether the situation is good or whether the situation is bad, is not affected. You are not affected by circumstances. You are not affected by situations of this life. If you hear the worst of the news, you will shout for joy because he said, in everything, give what? Thanks to God. When they tell you that your husband just had an accident and he died, what do you do? You give praise to God. You thank God. Because the Bible says we should not mourn like the unbelievers. The reason why you can do that is because of joy is in your heart. He, Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 17. Habakkuk 3 17. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, this business is not moving. Neither shall fruit to be in the vine. All the labor I have put inside of this thing, I have not seen anything. No. With all my fasting and prayer, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat. The flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stall. Verse 18. Can we read it together? Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. This thing must be rooted inside of you. What I mean by rooted inside of you, I am not saying that. It doesn't mean that I can, even if they tell me that my brother just died, my wife just died, my husband just died and all of that. No. But even when you are crying, even when you are mourning, even when you know deep inside of you, you are not ruled by all these things. Yeah, there is this aspect of man that will, you know, try to entertain the fact that somebody died or some, you lost something or something happened and all of that. But you receive the strength from within to keep pressing the joy of the Lord, which is your strength. So that is the reason why if somebody is contending with me over something and all of that, I will say, take, go. My life is not controlled by those things. If somebody wants to go one mile, be ready to go. If he takes your clothes, give him another one, he don't struggle. Just like and Abraham and Lot. God was the one that called Abraham. He didn't call Lot. And then God prospered Lot and Lot was so wealthy and, and Abraham was so wealthy and Lot was so wealthy. So much that their, the, the, their servants begin, began to quarrel over the space where the animals were fulfilled. So Abraham called Lot. He said, you know we are brothers. We are not supposed to be fighting and all of that. He said, man of peace. Now, what I want you to, although it is my right, but I give it to you, choose among, from this plane, whichever direction you want to go. That's the joy. He didn't regret it. He didn't say, this is my portion. Just like Jesus, the Bible said, although he was God, he didn't count it robbery to be poor with God, but he gave up. You've got to get to that point. But you, you must know this, and this thing must be rooted inside of you. It must be. So, even when situation happens and all of that, maybe you made that mistake and you didn't, you call it, you go back again. You tell yourself, you know one thing that I used to, what has helped me over the years, is that I have told myself, I say, you see the truth about God's word. Whether I am obeying it or not obeying, whether it is to my favor or not to my favor, the fact is that what the word of God said is it. It doesn't change the price of bread in the market. That is, who, that is what the word of God has become my standard. 
I might be making mistake. I might be falling away, but I will keep I keep referring. I say, God, I know this is your word. This is what I'm supposed to do. I want you to help me. Where I am now is not the right. God has always come true to me. He has saved me over time. Rather than, you know, there are people who quarrel with the word of God. You know, there are people who argue the word of God. You know, there are people who say, leave God alone. Leave the word alone. And you know, there are people who say, yes, I know that is the word of God. But, but what if the person does this and does that? But you know, this is the word of God. But, uh, yes, I know. But what if the person, so he's looking for a way to explain his whatever. You don't do such things. If you, if you are living like that, the kingdom of God cannot be established in you. You understand what I mean by kingdom of God being established? You must, you must have it as, as a, 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 a road map establishing you. Even though you are not getting there, but that has been a road map. And you keep referring to it. It will help you. It will draw you back. And finally... You must be a man of meekness. Meek, a quiet spirit. Lowliness, humble. Make up your mind about these things. Because God will resist the proud. And he offers grace to the humble. Because the meek, they are the ones that will inherit the earth. Learn of me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. Because I am meek, I am lowly. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He said, learn of me because I am meek. I am lowly. The first thing that you learn about God, about Jesus Christ, the first thing you say you should learn is meekness, is lowliness, is humility. You don't, you don't make yourself, the Bible says concerning Jesus Christ, he made himself of no reputation. Stop this thing. Stop, stop it. Stop it putting your head where you are not. You are nothing without him. Anything that you are today is because of him. Remove Jesus Christ from your life. You are empty. You are useless. Nobody, you, you even rag is better than you. What gives you value is Christ. Why they are, why those people are are valueless. They don't have value out there in the world. It's because of absence of Jesus Christ. That's why they can do anything they want. When they talk, you know, just like John was saying the other day, he said, there are these people, eh, these politicians, he said, you can't, when you listen to them, you will get angry with yourself. You will think, you will ask yourself, am I stupid? Is it that Is it that there's something wrong with me that I'm not reasoning well? No, you are reasoning well. It's because of the way they think. Government steals. And they are defending they are stealing. Unrighteousness. It will not offer you anything. Anything that you build on falsehood. Anything that you build with lies. Anything that you build with deception. Anything that you build with fraud of any sort. It must, it can never receive the blessings of God. Never. God will never approve of it. 
Don't tell me that this is the will of God. Because God does not do evil. Unrighteousness does not justify the righteousness of God. You cannot go and steal and come and use the money that you, you stole. You use it to build a hospital where people get, go and get treated. And you say that is a lie. God will never put his hand on that thing, on that hospital. It's a lie. For the world, they can be doing whatever they are doing in the world. But as far as the kingdom of God is concerned, this is who God is. You must, these are the things you must establish inside of you. When it is establishing you, they will control you. Even when you are going this way, that thing pulls you back. The problem is that we have not, we have not come to terms with it. We are still dig dialing. We are still, it's not, I don't think, I don't. You know, just like we gather together now to raise a prayer point. He said, let us pray for, let us pray for Labor Party. Hey, hey. there's nothing I will not see. You know, there is APC here. There is a PDP. There is a ANPP. There is AYC, there are YPP, there are YYC, there is APCA, there is so many of them there. So you cannot pray because we don't agree. Even when God say it is this one that I want, you will see, see people who say no because of what they are going to get from me. It doesn't matter what God is saying. So that is it. But you have to come to a point where God, your word is a final authority in my life. Whether I agree with it or, or I don't agree with it, or whether I believe it or not, God, your word is a law in my life. Anything your word says, that is what I stand for. Help me, draw me. Go and read Psalm 119 from the beginning to the end. You see what he said. That's why the, the word, the song they sang is pulled from that one, Psalm 119. Everything is about, he said, when I go, I say, draw me back to your word. Remember that I'm a stranger in this world. Direct me to your word. Because he has found that his word, the word of God, is the final authority. Because the Bible said that God has exalted his word over and above all his names. You can't contend with the word of God. If you contend with God's word, you are contending with God. So until you make up your mind, this is it for me. There is no going back. There is no going to the right or going to the right. When it comes to the word of God, whether I am doing it or not doing it, it doesn't matter. So when I make up my mind that way, when I miss it, God will draw me. And when somebody calls your attention and says, but this is the word of God, you can bring that person back. That's why the, one of the qualities of marrying a wife, you want to marry a wife, beauty is vain. Favor is deceitful. But the woman that fears God must be praised. The fear of God is to keep his commandments. So when you talk to somebody about the word of God, the person strengthens up. He will say, yeah, leave the word, hey, leave God. Hey, don't, don't come again. He doesn't say that. Once you bring the word of God, the person... And for you women... Should I talk? Should I talk? Yes. One of the men, one, one thing about the man you must not, you, I, you, it is better for you to remain single and die single. If that is a man, the only man that is left on planet Earth, don't marry him. You know that kind of a person? You know the person? Should I tell you? A man that is insecure. Hmm? 
a man that is insecure. There are some of them here. I didn't say anybody. Because everybody, all of us here are not the same. If you see a man that is insecure, don't ever marry that person. Because you will, you, you, you will experience hell. Not hell, sorry. You will experience hell fire. Because he is insecure. What's the name of that young lady that died, singer? You know the husband? Insecure. Insecurity. That's a problem. There are many of them. The other one that, that was um, a redeemed pastor. Sorry, I'm mentioning the name and all of that. He's, uh, that killed his wife. What is the problem? Insecurity. This is the extreme of it. They've taken it to the extreme. That's what he will finally get to. A man that is afraid of your success as a woman. He doesn't want you to earn more than himself. He doesn't want you to be popular more than himself. He will put you down. He will not allow you to express yourself. Every one of us here as a man, we have it. If you ever get mad, he will, not, he will oppress you and oppress you and oppress you. He will withdraw all the benefits and all of that to you. He will monitor you everywhere you go. Anything that is good that is coming your way, he will not like it. He will, so, and he is not going to open his mouth and voice it out. As a matter of fact, everyone has that issue, but there are people who have it in a good measure, pressed down, shaking together, are running over. And initially, you will not see it. They are the one that will tell you, I don't want you to go to church. Sit down, don't go to that church, you have to. And he will monitor you. He will get his phone. He will tell you to pin your location and everything. He will be monitoring you, following you everywhere and all of that. You will not be free. You can't express yourself. He doesn't want you to do anything. A man that is insecure is a disease. There is a version of it in women. Should I say? No, time is up. <laughs> we are coming back to his and hers. And I will tell you how to correct those problems. And I will show you how you, because some of you, you know, you know, my wife is wise. She's a wise woman. You know why? Because she saw me as a gold in the dustbin. She was able to identify that this is a gold but he's inside the dustbin. He went for it. And that's why she agreed. Will he agree to marry me? Yes, yes, yes. When you see, some of you, when you see gold in the dustbin, you will not recognize it. Because you want tall, Dark. I don't know whether they see you use dark again. Tall, fair, and handsome. Someone who has made it. He has a car. He has a house. I'm not coming into his house to start struggling. When you see a gold, you will not take it because you are looking for. You see all these things that you are. You see, that's why I say, I, when sometimes I talk to some of these men, when I talk to them, I hear the kind of thing that I say, I said, okay, there's no problem. 
you will get there when the time comes. You know Toad. Do you know Toad? How many of you know Toad? I don't think you know. Do you know if you have known Toad? Do you know one thing that Toad doesn't know in his life? He doesn't know that there are two kinds of water. He doesn't know that there is hot water. All his life he has been inside. He doesn't know there is hot water. That that same water, it can be hot and it will kill. It kill you. I say to people, look at me. I am married since 1990, June 12, 1999. This is how many years now? 23 years. That is about 22 years experience in marriage. Look at me and my wife. Look at me, look at my children, look at my family. So I have some level of grace to be able to talk along this line. And I've been doing this thing for more than 25 years of preaching. I've told our men, they are shaking their head like this and doing like, I will leave you. I don't care. Just go ahead. Do whatever you want to do. But wisdom says, you want to get married, a man. You see all these women that you see here? Hmm? The worst woman here, eh? the worst woman here is better than the best out there, whether it's in another church. I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not telling you, don't come and marry my daughters. I'm not telling you, don't come and marry them. <laughs> because some of you, I know what some of you are thinking. Eh, eh. He's saying uh, this uh, because I know he may, because he's mine, he has three of them. Three <laughs> children. I'm not asking you. And as a matter of fact, self, I don't even want you to come. <laughs> if you think that that is what I'm saying, I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. God bears me witness. You want to get married. You see these women that are here. Choose from them. If what you are looking for, if you are looking for peace, if you are looking for joy, if you are looking for fulfillment in life with your partner, go for them. Do you know why I said so? Because you are what you hear. It is what you hear that you believe. It is what you believe that you say. It is what you say that you do. You can't do what you don't believe. Anything that somebody is doing today is as a result of what you believe. And you're hearing and hearing it the raw, correct, direct. No missing whatever. You hear the truth about this. It will save you. These are the kind of people that when, see, don't marry somebody that when you hear them, there is one I'm trying to do. He say, if you like, go and tell pastor. I won't even answer him. He's not subject. He's not afraid of anybody and all of that. He's not subject to the church. There are people, if you see the calls that I get, I said, okay, tell your husband to come. He said, ah, he won't come home. He doesn't want to listen to any, he doesn't church, uh, church anything. He doesn't respect any pastor and all of that. Did he start? He had been there. He didn't start over. It's not then that he started. He had been there from the beginning. He doesn't have regard and respect for God and the church. But if he sees somebody that he says, ah, I will tell pastor, he say, please, please, please. I will let the church, he say, please, 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 please. Let us settle it. Because he's afraid of God. He's afraid of the leadership of the church. 
Don't follow anybody that doesn't have any regard for authority. Spiritual authority for that matter. You will die before your time. It is better you remain single. Don't get married. Stay that way and die and go to heaven. And they enter your estate, your city. Than to enjoy hell here and hell fire. And then when you cross over there, you go to the outer darkness and continue from there. Amen. Amen. What are the things that I say that you should that must be established in you. When these things are established, you are going to begin to see open doors, prosperities, breakthroughs, healing, deliverance, and all of You are not going to be experiencing the... You will be delivered and you, will be, you remain delivered. You will be healed and you remain healed. You will prosper and you remain prosperous. It's not a question of going front and back and all of that. You establish in it. When these things are established in you, it will, it will reflect and manifest in everything about you. But when you are pressing to go and get these things outside, that is why he said, I know you have need for all these things, but leave them. Seek it first. Get these things established in you first. It will give you all these other things. You will, it, they, will become, they will be coming to you. I mean, testimony, just like some of you here are testimonies. So what do I say, number one? Number two? A life of grace, number three? You will no longer be meddling with sin and all of that. Number four? Righteousness, number five? You are going to enjoy the life of peace, number six? And number seven? Men, 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 these people, clap for yourself. <laughs> Let's stand up to our feet and bless God for such a wonderful time. The entrance of his word, the Bible says it gives light. Is a lamp unto my feet, is a light unto my path. It guides me on daily basis. The lamp is what I used to see where I am going one step after the other around you. The light onto my path is your future, your destiny. It reveals your destiny, the way to go. It reveals your daily walk with God, the daily activities you do. It guides you, the word of God, the word of God, the word of God. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the entrance of your word is light, is lamp and light to us, Lord, we bless you. We give you all the praise and glory and honor for the ears that have heard this, Lord. For the heart that have understood it, Lord. For the grace to do them, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray concerning everyone at the sound of my voice this morning. Those who are watching online, likewise. And Father, I thank you for every one of them in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, because they, they have heard and they believe it. There shall be a performance in their lives. I said there shall be a performance in your life. I said there shall be performance in your life. In the name that is above all names. In the name of Jesus, it shall be established in you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of God will have expression in your life. They will be rooted and they will abound in your life. In the name of Jesus. And you begin to see the dimensions of it, both in this life and in the life to come. In the mighty name of Jesus. May the grace of God begin to walk like never before in your life. The grace of God that is at work in you, it helps you every day. It helps you in every turn of your life. May that be released upon your life today. In the name of Jesus. That is why when they say there is a casting down, your story will be different because there is a lifting on your life. I said there is a lifting on your life. I said there is a lifting on your life. In the name of Jesus, from today and tomorrow and onwards, you begin to take one step after the other. You will be established in the name of Jesus. 
and you will be like the city that is set on a hill. You will shine and you continue to shine. You will no longer be in obscurity in the name of Jesus. Arise! For it is the Father's good will to give you the kingdom. Receive it in the name of Jesus. I say receive it in the name of Jesus. Glory be to your name. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Son. And in the name of the Holy Spirit.